This is a video response to Kiwi Ted Fernie's video contest about more obscure units of the Second World War. I'll be talking about Chinese soldiers of the Second Sino-Japanese War. But before I do, I just want to quickly cover my own small collection in my own small man cave, which used to be the Lego playroom, as evidenced by the kitty chairs and the kitty table. But as you can see, it's clearly been repurposed for my purposes. So starting from the top is my brand new, now the pride of my collection, M1 Garand, 1955 date, HRA production, Harrington and Richardson. I got this from the FedEx office two days ago. And here's the tag that it came with from the CMP. This is a CMP uh, sold rifle. As you can see, it's pretty much never been used, really. The uh, muzzle and throat readings go from 1 to 10, 1 being, you know, brand new, and 10 being an absolute sewer pipe. And this is some 42 and 43 dated um, 30-06. If you haven't uh, already, I highly recommend getting these two books, um, or somehow getting your paws on them, The Man One Garand World War II and Post World War II. And they're both written by a guy named Scott A. Duff. Uh, it's a very, very good book. Highly recommend it. And I'm very sorry to hear that your M1 Garand has been impounded in Australia. I hope you get that soon. The next rifle is the pride of my bolt action collection. It's a veteran bring back all matching except for the bolts. Um, Carbiner 98K. It came originally with this very old and very beat up, you know, worn sling. So I decided to replace it with a repro. And here's just some uh, 8mm Mauser, some Yugoslav stuff. And this Czech bayonet, which was used by the Germans. And you can tell because the Germans, when they acquired these bayonets, ground off the muzzle ring. And the Czechs originally had a full muzzle ring. The Germans ground that off in order to make it conform to their standards. And this book here is an excellent book on the German Mauser rifles. It's called Backbone of the Wehrmacht by Richard D. Law. Next rifle, which you'll be seeing later, is the Type 38 Arisaka. Very long rifle, fires a, you know, a rather odd 6.5 by 50 millimeter semi-rimmed round, which is a bit odd. And it has the original bayonet right there. A huge thing, very long, and a repro sling. Next rifle down is my Swiss 96-11 rifle. Um, I've been watching your YouTube channel for a long time, and I've seen that recently you acquired one of these as well. Here's the round it fires, the 75 by 55 You know, it comes in a steel and uh, waterproof cardboard um, clip, I guess. I'm not sure if you call it a stripper clip or not. And there's the muzzle cover. It's a match rifle, practically. The trigger is excellent. The barrel is pristine. And it came with the original sling here. Now, the way you tell the difference between an original 1911 production rifle and a rifle that's been modified from the 96 configuration is this splicing here. The original 96 rifles did not have a uh, semi-pistol grip. They just, it was straight down. Uh, the stock went just straight. So they just spliced in a, um, a section of wood to make it form into a semi-pistol grip. Next rifle down, it's just your run-of-the-mill Mosi Nagant that's been imported into the States recently with a bayonet and tool kit. Ammo. The next one down is my the last of my World War II era rifles. It is a Italian Carcano model 91/41. The Italians were dissatisfied with the performance of their rifles, their short rifles and carbines, so they went to this long rifle deal again. And here's a 22 CZ 452 22 cal. And here's a my my only shotgun. It's a break barrel deal. And this one was actually made by New England Firearms, which I believe goes by the name H.R. Harrington and Richardson as well, which are the same guys that built my M1. Chinese soldier during the Second Sino-Japanese War, specifically that of the uh, NRA and a bit more specifically the 88th Division, um, which, is, uh, which belongs to Chiang Kai-shek, who was generally Sumo of nationalist forces. Um, this subject is very complex. The Second Sino-Japanese War encompasses a very large period of time between 1931 and 1945. And that is a seamless, you know, there was a seamless transition into the Chinese Civil War, which ended in 1949 with the formation of the PRC and the subsequent booting out of the nationalists onto the island of Taiwan. But to understand all this, you have to understand actually politics probably going to the, at least to the beginning of the 20th century, and the turn of the 20th century, and probably another 50 or so years, maybe even 100 years before that. 
So to highly, highly simplify things, uh, and uh, as a disclaimer, I have no beef with anybody. I have no beef with any of the colonial powers that kind of nibbled China apart. I have no beef with the Japanese except for that small portion of, you know, that small minority of assholes who want to, like, you know, gloss over it in their schools and say basically, uh, and those folks that say, you know, you have never, you, ne you don't have any proof that the Nanjing Massacre ever happened. Yeah. You know, those are the only folks I have beef with. But uh, China, what happened was culturally, China turned its back on the rest of the world, and so because they saw themselves as being culturally and just every superior in every way, to and they paid else. the price in the 19th century on the uh, when they got nibbled apart by the various European colonial powers. Russia got Port Arthur. Um, the Brits were very successful in dealing dope to the Chinese populace. So China tried to industrialize. And one of the things in, you know, going into armaments, one of the things they did was they built, you know, battleships of the time. They contracted the French to build, I think, two battleships. And they adopted a uh, the German 1888 commission rifle, and uh, called the Hanyang 88. Um, I don't have a uh, German Gewehr 88, and I don't have a Hanyang 88, but I do have the next best thing, which is this here. It's an Italian Carcano. It derives a lot of its features. It takes, uh, it's heavily um, inspired by the Gewehr 88. It uses the uh, Mannlicher style magazine system, as the Gewehr 88. The bolt is, I believe, a very, uh, it has been uh, inspired by the Gewehr 88. Uh, I realize that this video is starting to take a long time. So I'm just going to skip most of the politics and go straight to, you know, the equipment and the soldiers. Uh, with this one exception. Ch uh, China and Germany did a lot of trade during the interwar years. It's called the Sino-German Cooperation. It's a very interesting subject because not many people know that it happened. Um, what happened was, after the First World War, China and Germany reestablished trade relationships and diplomatic ties. And, you know, Germany needed to rebuild its military. And to do so, they needed raw materials. China could provide like, all these raw materials in large, large quantities. So Germany uh, offered its, you know, industrial and its uh, military expertise in exchange for these, and obviously trade occurred. Um, Germany sent over advisors and, you know, technical advisors, military advisors to oversee training. They created an elite group of, you know, officers, an elite group of, uh, a, a small elite group of uh, divisions, of which the 88th division would be uh, one of them that I'll talk about. And uh, since they were obviously trained in the German style, they kind of went to war with German equipment. You'll see them in historical photographs with the uh, M35 Stahnhelm, the German helmet, the coal scuttle helmet. And uh, they would have used a rifle very similar to this one here. This is a German Car 98K. Uh, the Chinese went to war with um, a copy of the 1933 Standard model called the Type 24 rifle. Named after the 24th year of its adoption in the in years, you know, of the uh, since the establishment of the Chinese Republic, which translates to 1936. And uh, they're both 98 uh, pattern Mauser 98 pattern rifles. The only real difference between the Car 98K and the Type 24 slash the Chandert model would be the Car 98K lacks gripping grooves in the stock and has a turned down bolt handle, whereas the um, Type 24 and the Chandert model would have had a flat one. And there's some other cosmetic differences as well, but uh, I won't really discuss them. Um, the Chinese also used uh, imported Czechoslovakian VZ-24 rifles, and then also they imported uh, ZB-26 uh, light machine guns as well. They also used Maxim machine guns chambered in the 7.92 cartridge as well. I'm not quite sure how close they were to the German MG-08, but um, they were um, Maxim guns in the 7.92 cartridge. Uh, Pistol-wise, I think they used the uh, Mauser broom handle, the C96, to a great degree. preferred by officers because um, you know, because of its uh, the wooden uh, the wooden butt plate the attachable butt plate doubled as a um, holster um, so as I said 
these rifles were used by the um, elite, you know, that, that small group of elite divisions that would eventually take a pounding during the fighting in Shanghai. And unfortunately, most of the Chinese soldiers uh, didn't have a rifle of this quality. There's actually, I think there are stories that uh, Madame, uh, Madame Chang went to the German factories at Mauser Orbendorf. She came across a door to a room that said, you know, rejected components, and she asked, you know, why were these components rejected? And they said, you know, they didn't meet German, uh, German quality control. And she said, well, it probably, uh, you know, would they, could they still be assembled into fully functioning rifles? Uh, and the German, you know, technical advisor said, jawohl, Madame Chang, and then, or Frau Chang, and then there was a deal arranged, and from rejected components came, you know, fully assembled rifles to be shipped to China. Unfortunately, a lot of folks, you know, a lot of Chinese soldiers probably couldn't get their hands on these nice rifles, so they went to something, um, they probably took off the body of a dead, um, a deceased Imperial Japanese soldier, which would have been the Type 38 Arasaka rifle. This is in a, um, this, this is a Type 38, an early Type 38 Arasaka. It's got the original dust cover, and it's got a very long 31 and a half inch barrel. Um, the Japanese Arasaka is chambered in this 6.5 by 50 millimeter semi rim cartridge. It's a bit odd. Um, the ballistics of it are a 139 grain bullet traveling at about 2,500 feet per second. And uh, I've heard a lot of folks call this cartridge anemic. I think it's on par with all the other 6.5 cartridges of the time. But, um, you know, a lot of the folks seem to say that, um, you know, if it's not 30 out 6, if it's not, you know, 7.62 NATO or, you know, thir or um, 308 Winchester, then it's considered anemic. You know, I think, you know, that uh, it's actually not the case. It probably did its job just fine. That being said, the Japanese did go to the 7.7 .7 caliber cartridge. Um, I do have an original Japanese bayonet. What's a Japanese rifle without a Japanese bayonet? As you mentioned in one of your videos, the Japanese were particularly enthusiastic users of the bayonet. Get it on like that? Yep. And unfortunately, as you also stated, most, are, uh, most of the uh, people on the receiving end of these were, in fact, civilians or prisoners of war. And uh, it's a very long combination. You probably won't be able to see this, but I'm 6'1", and the tip of the blade comes up to the tip of my nose. But otherwise, it's a very solid rifle. They're known for being um, the most sturdy action of all the uh, World War II era bolt. I'm going to fast forward to the year 1937, the Battle of Shanghai. And I know I said I skip politics, but I have to explain this as well. Chiang Kai-shek was a bit, in a bit of a pickle, a political pickle, because he was the leader of nationalist forces, and he was seen as the only person that could really effectively take on the Japanese. Um, the problem was he didn't have the strength to do so. As I said, he had a small group of German-trained, German-equipped divisions, the 88th being one of them. But uh, he just didn't have enough men to fight them. So, and the international community had seen Chiang Kai-shek as, you know, the, the de facto leader of China, but he was just too weak, and the Japanese would eventually win. And you have to remember, this is post-World War I. Nobody wanted to get involved in any fighting except for the aggressors themselves. The Chinese populace saw him as being weak because he didn't want to fight the Japanese in a full-on war because, as I said, he didn't have the strength. So what he chose to do was he opted for these small incidents where, you know, somebody shot at somebody or something like that and uh, a firefight erupts and some Japanese soldiers died, you know, would, would end up dead, some Chinese soldiers would end up dead. Small incidences like these. That's what he preferred. And he preferred this because he could officially be at peace with the Japanese and just build, continue, you know, uh, building up his uh, his strength. On the other hand, if he opted to go to war with the Japanese, he risked doing so prematurely, as I said. But his uh, he would be seen in better standing with he, his popularity would probably shoot up with the Chinese populace and probably with the international community as well. So in Shanghai, he would finally decide to go uh, fight the Japanese head on. So the Battle of Shanghai started with I think the, it's called the Oyama Incident to use that word again. A Japanese lieutenant named Oyama was shot dead by Chinese soldiers. Nobody knows, you know, who really started it. But uh, the Japanese were furious, not surprisingly. And things kind of just escalated out of control. The Japanese decided to land uh, Marines. The Chinese, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist government, sent in his German-trained divisions. 
and they hammered the Japanese Marines, they hammered the Japanese forces in the area and drove them practically into the river. Um, after the first day of shooting, Chang and his nationalist government released a statement saying effectively, you know, we are now, we, Japan and China, the nationalist Jap Chinese, exist in a state of open war. And so now officially on paper, China, nationalist China and Japan were now at war. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, German trained divisions and the other Chinese troops forced the Japanese nearly into the river, but the Japanese had air support and they had, uh, they had naval ships in the river, and they were, the Japanese Marines were calling for naval uh, fire support. And so the, just the combination of gunfire and air support forced the Chinese soldiers back because they had nothing to you know, fight. You know, there wasn't much they could do against them. So that's when the fighting really started, you know, that's when the brutal, brutal fighting started, house to house, street to street. And you have to remember, this is 1937, prior to the, uh, tr you know, what's considered the outbreak of the First Second World War in Poland, 9th September something of 1939. And uh, the, the horrors of urban combat were not yet completely known. The Spanish Civil War was occurring roughly in the same period, I believe. But... Uh, and people were watching, military leaders were watching intently in the Spanish Civil War to learn what kind of new, uh, how warfare had evolved, essentially. And Shanghai was another one of those places where, you know, urban combat, you know, they spec the, uh, the ugliness of urban combat reared its ugly head and showed itself to the world. And so fighting, as I mentioned, was particularly brutal. Um, the Chinese made exclusive, use, extensive, I'm sorry, extensive use of machine gun nests and, you know, sandbag fort fortifications, etc., etc. And the Japanese used uh, naval gunfire, air support, and uh, they even used mustard gas in the city. And so, just after two months or so of fighting, I believe, the fighting was from like September, beginning of September to the end of October. So about two months uh, worth of fighting. And just the Chinese uh, troops, the Chinese uh, formations were just taking a beating from this uh, urban meat grinder. The German trained divisions, the elite, you know, the uh, Chang's elite soldiers were particularly hit hard, especially his officer corps. The men he could trust, the officers that trained at the uh, Wampoa, the Huangpu uh, Military Academy, those guys that he could trust uh, were, took an especially large amount of casualties. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he decided to pull out, and um, to, to to let them uh, to let them pull out to let them evacuate from the city. He decided to leave the 88th Division behind as a rear guard. Except the commander of the 88th Division said, "Screw you! I'm not leaving behind my entire division. I'm going to leave behind one regiment." And then he later changed his mind to one reinforced battalion. And this is this is what led to what's called the defense of Suhang Warehouse. Suhang Warehouse is obviously a warehouse situated on the river, I forget the name of it, but um, it was originally the division's headquarters that had been fortified. This, and then, uh, this ba the defense of Sahang Warehouse is seen culturally by the Chinese as almost an Alamo. And it's actually extremely important because, as I mentioned, uh, it's culturally important. It shows Chi you know, uh, determined Chinese resistance against the Japanese. As I said, it's an Alamo sort of deal where a bunch of determined resistors fight off wave after wave of uh, attackers. Second, um, it was as Chang wanted. Chang, you know, as I mentioned earlier, he wanted to show that China could in fact resist the Japanese, and he chose to do so at Shanghai. But this place especially so, because the location of Suhang Warehouse is extremely important. It's situated right next to a river, and there's a bridge going across, and on the other side of the river, like 200 yards away, is the international settlement, where the French, Chinese, I mean, French, uh, British, Russians, Americans, all, they all would have been watching. In this regard, the Japanese did not dare to use air support. They did not dare to call in, you know, naval gunfire onto the, the warehouse because they feared if, uh, you know, they overshot it, you know, shells would land in the international settlement and they wanted to, to avo avoid that. They also could not use mustard gas because that would also be a PR disaster in full view of the international settlement with all their reporters and diplomats and whatnot. They did not, the Japanese did not want that. So they had to rely almost exclusively on infantry. And uh, I think they had a couple armored cars and tankettes. But the uh, Chinese resisted those as well. They fought those off. So the fighting at Sihang Warehouse lasted from 
four or five days from October 26th to November 1st. Uh, the warehouse was defended by 426 men, including 16 officers, and they faced off against the Japanese 3rd uh, Division or something like that. And so, um, now how the story, how the defense of Sahang Warehouse, the defenders got the name, the 800 Heroes of Sahang Warehouse, is that um, he, uh, the, com the commander was giving a pep talk to his men, and he said, so like, you know, he said, so men, uh, what shall we do at this warehouse, or something to that effect? And all his soldiers cried, "We'll fight to the last cartridge, to the last man." And so, in order to show, like you know, in order to show his commitment, he decided to release. He wanted to release the name of his soldiers uh, to the country, predicting that he and his, uh, you know, his men would uh, all, every single one of them, would die in the defense of the warehouse. So, but unfortunately, that obviously would lead to the Japanese knowing the strength and the disposition of his forces. So what he ended up doing was he just released the name of all 800 of, of his men uh, in his original assignment. So that's how the men of the uh, of Suhan Warehouse got the name the 800 Heroes, despite the fact they were only about half that number. And so for five days they fought off repeated Japanese attacks. Um, uh, there was one instance where a soldier just went completely berserk and, you know, hand grenades like pulled uh, with the pins pulled, he ran out and you know into a group of Japanese soldiers and blew himself up, and all the Japanese soldiers. And again, this is just uh, you, these stories are not unheard of if you look into Stalingrad and if you look into uh, Leningrad and Berlin and all those horrible uh, urban battlefields. But uh, this this was seen, this was documented by the Chinese press. There's actually a story of a little schoolgirl, nine-year-old schoolgirl, something like that, going back and forth between the lines, um, you know, delivering information, delivering like you know, um, the letters like from the civilians saying you know the Japanese are moving from point A to point B, watch out. Um, apparently, she delivered cigarettes and things to that of that nature, um, and uh, just for five days this happened. And uh, actually, there's also a story of a man going to the Shanghai uh, Department of Commerce or something like that and then finding the warehouse's telephone and then telephoning the warehouse and saying, you know, watch out, there's Japanese coming your way. And things like that. Um, and it was just it was just kind of seared into the Chinese memory, just culturally. The, the place is still a museum. The Sahang Warehouse still exists today. It's a museum to uh, the Chinese war resistance against Japanese, you know, whatever. And, uh, so it also accomplishes what Chang wanted, and he showed to the world, literally 200 yards away, that um, his soldiers could fight the Japanese, they just needed foreign support. And so um, that's pretty much where I'm going to end. Uh, the 88th Division uh, suffered too heavily, too greatly in the battle for Shanghai and in the retreat to Nanjing. And uh, obviously everyone knows what happened at Nanjing. The, the defenses broke rather easily. And, uh, you know, in full, in the, whole, in the entire world more or less got, got word that the Japanese were just brutalizing the population. My grandmother was there. She was actually in Shanghai when the fighting started and her, as a nine-year-old, seven-year-old girl. And her family uh, ran away to Nanjing. And then the Jap they were there when the Japanese came, and my grandmother to this day won't talk about what happened, probably probably because she saw a lot of shit go down. Um, what else can I say? Um, the 88th Division never fully recovered uh, because what happened was the Germans, obviously being allies with the Japanese, had to pull, had to yank their advisors, had to yank their support, and so these German trained divisions, German equipped divisions, never really recovered. Once the Americans entered the war, they tried, uh, you know, the, the Americans began to help the Chinese uh, with the so-called um, the airlift over the, him, the hump. Uh, the 88th, I believe, was eventually sent to Burma, but I'm not very well read on uh, their exploits, if they had any exploits there, um, because they were just, I think they were just too weak to do much. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I hope this video didn't go too long. Um, I hope this was educational for you and anyone else that's been watching. And uh, may the best contender win.